Welcome to the first real episode of Design Documentaries Project Pokin. I am your host, Soberdorf. In case you missed the announcement because for some reason YouTube loves to not notify people when I make a new video, I'm developing my own video game. What kind of game? I don't know. This is the first video. We haven't made it quite that far yet. What we're here to do is figure that out. But before we know what we're going to make, we need to learn how we're going to make it. Sure, at one point in history you could have just... Wait, what? You don't recognize me? I mean, I know it's been a while, but... Oh, right, right. I've never really told you about the voice and the body, have I? This is kind of awkward, but I suppose if you're going with me for this journey, you ought to know. You see, over the past couple of years, I've decided to transition my content order to fulfill my dreams as a game designer. One fateful night I was playing video games and then suddenly I was sucked into the game world. You'd think that would be awesome, but unfortunately at the time I was playing Quest 64 and I really want to get home. The only way I can manage to do that is by successfully creating a video game in the hopes that someday someone will play it and it'll open the portal to bring me back into the real world. Until then, this is my new body. It's still a work in progress. I'm trying to shed a few polygons in some areas and add them to others, if you know what I mean. But anyway, that's not important. We're here to talk about game engines. At one point, you could simply sit at your computer desk, write a bunch of code with nothing but your favorite text editor of choice. But nowadays, that's not very realistic. Depending on what kind of game you're making and what you're developing for, it's an incredibly difficult proposition to make anything from scratch. Now, I know most of you already know what a game engine is, but for the sake of completeness, a game engine is more or less a pre-compiled set of code to help develop your game. A game engine could be as simple as a few libraries that you include in your code to make your game act in a specific way. But more commonly, an engine is usually a fully featured program that allows you to adjust your game's physics, add graphics. Most include easy to use interfaces, visual scripting, tools to easily test and debug, and many other quality of life features. Well, certainly we could just pick any game engine and try to make it work for us. Certain game engines are better than others for different kinds of games, or they run on different hardware, or some are made for different experience levels. There are also hundreds to choose from, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. If you never made a game before, how do you figure out which one to choose? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Today in Project Boken, we're taking a look at game engines. Before we get into it, I want to mention that this isn't going to be a comprehensive look at every engine, nor are the engines that we cover going to be in full detail. While it is important to make an informed decision, you don't really need to know everything about an engine before you decide to use it. An engine might determine what kind of platforms we can develop our game on, as well as the kind of games we can develop, so some engines might provide some limitations, but modern engines can roughly work with any concept you might have. And for the most part, they have their fair share of similarities. It's really about picking the one that works best for you as a person. That being said, there are a few priorities that I have in mind, but my primary focus is on it being cheap. Preferably free, but definitely under 100, or at the very least, free with licensing. Which... I'm going to come right out and say this is going to be a running theme throughout the entire series. Now, that might sound limiting, but let's see where it can take us. The two most popular game engines as of this video are the Unreal Engine and the Unity Engine. You can know nothing about game development at all, and chances are you're still pretty familiar with these engines. And for good reason, they're both incredibly robust development environments, capable of doing pretty much anything that you can imagine, 
Both have an incredible amount of documentation and tutorials, and both are free to develop with entirely reasonable licensing agreements. There are considerable differences between the two though. The Unreal Engine is developed by Epic, who at one point used to develop a really great arena shooter known as Unreal Tournament, but is now known for a less successful storefront than Steam, Zoomer shooters, and questionable business practices. Initially, the Unreal Engine was primarily used to develop first-person shooters, but now on its fourth edition, soon to be fifth, can make anything from fighting games, puzzle games, pixel art panorama RPGs, pretty much anything. The development environment primarily uses what is known as blueprints, a visual scripting environment that gives you kind of a flowchart of your code. It's pretty nice because if you never programmed before, you get a very good visual representation of what's going on, with some projects not even needing to get into the code at all. When you do need to get into the code, it uses C++, which is a very common programming language with a lot of documentation out there. And it's my personal language of choice, mainly because that's what I was taught. The entire Unreal Engine is also open code, meaning you can modify it to whatever your needs are, even though it's like 2 million lines of code. And while obviously I'm not one who puts too much emphasis on graphics, if you put a lot of polish into your game, you can make it look amazing. There's a reason why companies like Nintendo or Square Enix use their engine at times. Unreal does have some drawbacks, however. It's a powerful engine, but that power limits what you can develop for. It was primarily built on AAA development, and that shows when it comes to older hardware. And also, you might not have the time or want to put the effort into polishing your game's graphics, meaning you lose some of the engine's best qualities. But also because it's for AAA development, its licensing model is extremely generous. It's free to develop and publish, and furthermore, Epic only takes a 5% royalty if you succeed. And their definition of success is if your project makes over a million dollars. Something I'm probably not going to have to worry about. Unity, on the other hand, isn't a bad alternative to Unreal. It's less powerful, a little bit slower, and it lacks Unreal's open code feature. But what it lacks in power, it more than makes up for itself in versatility. Which is why a lot of new and indie developers use it. Also, there is a metric crap ton of support for the Unity engine. There's a lot of updates, there's tutorials and documentation, lots of supporting applications. It also features an incredibly robust asset store, including a lot of free assets, which is great if you're not artistically inclined or just don't have the time. Unity uses C Sharp, which is arguably a better or at least easier version of C++. It also features its own blueprints-like visual scripting known as Bolt, meaning you don't have to get too deep into the code either. You can also develop for a variety of different platforms. I mean, if you really wanted, you could find an old version of Unity and develop for the Wii. Or we can develop for the PlayStation Vita, because Vita means life, and just because Sony quit supporting the Vita doesn't mean that we have to. I'm telling you, the PlayStation Vita is this generation's Dreamcast. Wait, where was I? Oh, yeah. Its licensing model is also fairly generous, with you not having to pay anything unless your project makes over 100000 within a year. Nothing I have to worry about, but it might be important if you're a smaller studio. However, just because those are the two most popular choices doesn't mean that they're the best choices. What about the best kind of engine? The entirely free kind of engine. Well, if you're a fan of no upfront payment, no down payment, no subscription, no licensing fees, no royalties, entirely open source with no weird DRM, which you should be, there is Godot, or Godot, or however you pronounce it. You don't have the power of Unreal and you don't have the support of Unity, but instead the focus of Godot is accessibility. It uses something known as GDScript which is an engine-specific language that's designed to be easy to learn and cause minimal fuss. And if that isn't robust enough for you, you can also use its blueprint-like visual scripting, as well as C-sharp. Despite it not being a household name like the other two engines, 
Godo has a strong community with a lot of support, and it's still surprisingly capable. In fact, for 2D games, it's regularly rated higher than the Unity engine. It doesn't do 3D as well, but it's still capable of it. Speaking of 2D, there is also Game Maker Studio, which is likely the most popular for 2D games and really only 2D games. Being built for that purpose, Game Maker Studio has been the engine behind some of the biggest indie games developed in the past several years. It's easy to develop with, with a lot of nice drag and drop abilities that's very useful for newcomers. Genuinely, this would have been my engine of choice if not for its pricing model. It's subscription based, software as a service. Unless you're wanting to develop for the Opera browser, Listen, I'm still using a student copy of Adobe CS6 for a reason. And that reason is that one, I think you should be able to own software that you buy. And the second reason is because, well, I'm cheap. Which, paying 80 bucks for the ability to develop for consoles is not. I just wanted to bring it up for completeness sake and, you know, it might not be as bad of a limitation for you. However, for me, it's just not an option. Now, with any of these engines, we can more or less make anything we can possibly imagine. Be it a simple platformer, a point-and-click adventure, a tactics-based RPG with deck-building elements, a beat-em-up where you play as a bunch of cat maids with dating sim elements. Our only limitations is time, skill, and our imagination. Which, don't get me wrong, those are limiting factors. Also, the more ambitious your game gets, development becomes exponentially more complex, and therefore more time-consuming to make. For development studios who can share the load, this isn't an issue, but I'm a single person, and I don't really have tangible experience with any of these engines. While I could make a fairly impressive demo or at least a proof of concept, I want to develop a complete game. So, if we're willing to make a lot of sacrifices for versatility, an engine that's entirely dedicated could allow us to put something together much faster. One of the most popular engines for new developers is RPG Maker. Okay, okay, wait, wait, hold on. Just a moment. Yes, RPG Maker is Babby's first game engine. And there are a lot of drawbacks to using it. It means we're locked into making a mid-90s JRPG, and that game is going to look, sound, and play a lot like the other RPG makers on Steam. It's also not cheap. The newest version is $80 at base, and it includes a ton of microtransactions. But if you're completely new to game design, I would recommend it. The nice thing about RPG Maker is if you have no experience in game development whatsoever, if you haven't even looked at what a line of code is, it's still extremely easy to learn. He uses a built-in tabs-like system where you can test it and immediately see the results. It's also very difficult to screw up, which is something that can't be said for the blueprints-like systems that most modern engines use. And because of that, you can put together a game very, very quickly. Also, RPGs are a fairly easy genre to design in general, so it is much easier to kind of stumble your way through. I would not shame anyone who wanted to use RPG Maker to dip their toes in development, or even if you're an experienced dev who just wants to put something together quickly. In fact, if you're willing to put in the work, you can do a lot to hide that generic RPG Maker look and feel. And even despite its ubiquity, you can make a very profitable game. The Japanese Eroge genre thrives on RPG Maker. I don't ask me how I know that. By a similar gesture, say that even game design is out of your reach. But you just so happen to be a decent artist and writer. Well, in that case, there's Renpai, an engine dedicated solely to making visual novels. All you really need is some interesting characters, a good story, and some backgrounds. And you can make anything from dating sims to mystery novels. Also, the Japanese Roge scene thrives off of Renpai. Don't ask me how I know that. But let's say you can't even draw, and you know some basic HTML that you learned back from 2008 MySpace. Well, there is Twine, which allows you to design your own choose-your-style adventure with some potential game elements. And you can still manage to be fairly successful with just that. 
Basically, I am saying if you want to make a successful game, all you have to do is make it loot. I mean, there is an engine out there for you. But who even says we have to make a video game? Game design in theory existed well before the era of computers. All we really need is a set of reference tables and some dice, and we can make our own tabletop role-playing game. Or with some card designing software and a good core concept, we could make our own collectible card game or living card game, deck building game, lewd waifu trading card game with 27 different rarities that somehow ties into a MMO mobile app. Uh, with so many options, why do I choose choice paralysis? Ah! But hey, who says we have to play to the standards of success? I mean, if I cared about success, I wouldn't have started my YouTube channel in 2015 talking about games that no one has ever heard of. Instead, I would have made adult visual novels. If you're willing to get a little avant-garde with it, there's nothing to say that we can't get a little weird with our game. So let's get weird. Remember Well of Souls, developed in the early 2000s? It was a game engine designed for creating a MMO. I played around with it plenty of times, but I never managed to successfully finish a project. I made a video where I talked all about that. Insert reference to video here. And good, YouTube should hopefully actually publish this video. I can make my own MMO complete with region locked classes, various factions and side quests, featuring a rabbit that calls you a droning clackdish complete with references that are not even relevant <laughs> even before I publish this video. Oh god. Crafting an open world and designing a game built on a unique archaic system that I'm sure dozens will play. You might not like it, but this is what peak Soberdorf looks like. But I think we can get even weirder. Why spend money to develop for RPG Maker on the PC when we can develop for RPG Maker on the original PlayStation? This was the first time I ever had a chance to get into game development. This version of RPG Maker is incredibly limited in scope. You had to use a controller to navigate menus, the asset creator was unwieldy at best, and imagine trying to type out your magnum opus with an on-screen keyboard. This was 13-year-old Soper's dream, and I remember spending hundreds of hours messing around with this trying to make my own Final Fantasy and you were legally allowed to sell your games. Just imagine releasing your ultimate game on the ultimate medium. PlayStation 1, memory cards. But we can go even weirder. You think the PlayStation version of RPG Maker is limited? Well, how about RPG Maker for the Game Boy Color? That's right, even more limited in functionality, even more limited in creation. Making our very own RPG that we can in no way share with the world unless we give away our one copy. Psh, non-fungible token. Get that f out of my face. GBC was a thing 22 years ago. But no, weirder, weirder. We're not just limited to RPGs, we can also make fighting games. Of course, there is Mugen, which is more traditionally used for your 2D sprite-based conglomerate fighter mega mix. But why make something professional when we can use Fighter Maker? That's right, we can make our own 3D fighting game that rivals the complexity of Tekken 7 without the benefit of mocap or the ability to make our own models. Now, you two can dominate the competition by T-posing your opponents into submission. And the best part is we don't have to give up our PlayStation 1 transferable media. But, ladies and gentlemen, and none of the above and everything in between, I do believe that we can get weirder. We can go back to the very first game development software on a gaming console and make our very own space shooter on the Nintendo with Dezamon. We can work with incredibly limited hardware, make our art assets using the NES controller, able to make a whopping three levels, making our own music using the in-game sequencer. But best of all, we can only share our creation by giving away our copy of the game. Yes, this is my engine. It was made for me. All right, this got out of hand pretty quickly, but I think you see the point I'm making. There are many, many options available to us, and really there isn't a wrong answer. Really, it's all dependent on what you want to make and how much work you want to make for yourself. 
Really, you want something that's going to cater to your strengths as a designer and support your weaknesses as a developer. Are you great at art but get intimidated by coding? Pick an engine that obfuscates a lot of the coding. Already happen to be a master C++ programmer? Then maybe you're better off not using an engine that has JavaScript. Do you just need an engine to sell itself to you using mid-2000s marketing? Well, there is an engine for you. My boo is tight and I'm telling you the deal I'm bringing it, singing it, bringing it for real Shoot a call to my boys and my homies send me back So we can kick off the jam and drop it like that Also, consider the needs for your project Even among 2D games, certain engines work better than others for certain genres Or perhaps you're expecting to sell a lot of copies Well, in that case, maybe PlayStation memory cards aren't the best choice for you Because, you know, chip shortage you want something that's going to work with you and not against you. But also, don't be afraid to pick something that's going to challenge you. Developing a game is a great way to learn how to code. Sure, making a first-person shooter on the Pico 8 might not exactly be working to the strengths of that engine, but those limitations might make a more interesting game, or at least one that can be remembered more fondly. So, what about my game? Well... In order to pick the best engine for me, I need to do a little bit of personal inventory. I don't have a specific kind of game in mind, so let's just say I'm willing to work with whatever limitations the engine has. I'm not planning on making the next big game, hardly anything that would be considered AAA, so I don't really need a powerful engine. But that being said, I do plan on selling it, so I'm going to want something that has sufficient means to distribute it to other people. So, therefore, no PlayStation memory cards. But also, I want it to be accessible. I want something that plenty of people can play without really any issue, financially or otherwise. And, of course, it needs to be cheap. That still leaves us with a lot of options, so let's keep going. The focus of this project is to be informative. And I don't mean in the sense of a edutainment kind of game. I want something that's going to allow me to pull from my experiences, but also share others' experiences as well. So, whatever engine we choose needs to facilitate a lot of discussion in that regard. I want something that's going to allow me to experience every part of the design process, not necessarily something that's going to give me too many shortcuts, or at least one that will allow me to take the long road if that's what I decide to do. But we're also making a full game, not just a proof of concept. We're talking opening to credits. So we're going to need an engine with a lot of quality of life features. And finally, I want something that is Soberdorf. I don't necessarily want an engine that's a tool. I want it to be part of the personality of the game. Something that might be a bit more obscure. Something with a story or narrative. I don't necessarily want it to be good, I want it to be interesting. So, after weeks of playing around with each engine, looking at all their features, or lack thereof, seeing which ones would provide the most interesting experience, and would otherwise allow me to create a game that is distinctly me, I have managed to narrow it down to one of two engines. Those engines are Nestmaker and GB Studio. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're real surprised. Me, Soberdorf, choosing an engine that's based on hardware that's well over 30 years old, that's pretty on brand for the channel, and that's more than enough reason for me. However, there are some legitimate reasons for choosing one of these two engines. The Nintendo Entertainment System and the Game Boy are both fairly early consoles, which means there are going to be a lot of limitations in regards to the hardware. I'll get into the specifics of those limitations over the next few videos, but simply put, there's only a finite amount of game that I can make. Eventually, probably sooner than I want, I'm going to hit a hard stopping point, which is kind of great because I am definitely one of those kinds of people that need to be put on a leash. Wait, what? But those limitations do more than just limit us to a certain scope of a project. I mean, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations after all. Having to design around those limitations might require us to come up with solutions to problems we might not otherwise face. 
and developing for these early consoles allows us to compare, contrast, and dissect their respective libraries to find out how other developers managed to accomplish what they did. It also enables us to look at the founding era of game design, or if we're gonna follow the conventional game design methods of the time or not. And as an added bonus, we develop for what is pretty much every console that has a homebrew scene. Emulation is everywhere, and it's accessible to anyone who even has a potato smartphone at this point. Yes, I'm developing for the Vita after all. Even better, it's entirely possible to produce a physical product that can play on genuine hardware. So let's take a look at both of these engines starting with Nestmaker. NES Maker is a relatively new engine that's in active development by the new 8-bit heroes after a successful Kickstarter in 2018. It's not free, but it's available for a reasonable 40-ish bucks. The engine's not as feature complete as something like Unity, but is more like RPG Maker XP. There's no blueprints like design, but it does allow you to drag and drop tiles, import, edit and draw sprites, adjust your palettes, adjust your rule sets and settings and physics, import music via Family Tracker, more or less all the tools you need to get started on making your own NES game. Nestmaker's goal is to allow you to make NES games without having to learn to code, but... It's fairly limited in that regard. You have to pick a module, which is effectively the genre of the game you're making. Even then, it only allows you to accomplish the most basic things in that genre. If you want to do anything more than that, you have to get into the game's code, which for the NES is 6502 assembly, and that is something I don't have any experience in. And for any of the projects I have in mind, there's just no way around it. I have to get into the code. That being said, while 6502 assembly can be intimidating, it's not incredibly difficult. And it does put me back at a level where I'm learning alongside of you. And the engine itself is nice enough to facilitate this. Alternatively, there is GB Studio. It's similar to Nestmaker, but instead of developing for the Nintendo Entertainment System, you're developing for its less capable cousin, the Game Boy. Developed by Chris Maltby, the GB Studio started as a tool he used for a game jam into something that ended up being in more active development. And it's available for pay-as-you-want on itch.io. Compared to NES Maker, it is more user-friendly with a focus on the no programming required idea, with the idea of making it as easy as possible to just import anything you need and plug it into a blueprints-like flowchart. Really, I noticed that the user interface is just better overall for what it wants to accomplish. Though, through its simplicity, you lose a lot of versatility. GB Studio, I'm, as far as I can tell, is entirely based on visual scripting, with no real way to get into the code of the game itself. Which means you're strictly limited to the actions that the engine provides. Which means you're not able to optimize your game. It means you're not able to implement tricks from other developers. Which means you're going to be limited on already limited hardware. But, spinning back into the positives with the release of the Analog Pocket, the GB Studio is closely integrated into that hardware, which in turn means it's more likely that the GB Studio is going to see more use, and more people are going to be exploring it and messing around and making their own Game Boy game. I mean, the cynic in me knows that it would make this series more popular because it would make the YouTube algorithm happy or whatever, but genuinely it also would mean that this is more helpful for people starting their own journey. This is a legitimately hard choice for me to make. The NES was my first console, and some of my favorite memories are with that console. In fact, you could argue that it was the NES that brought me to this point. The NES is the great, 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 great grandfather of modern game design. And while it's extremely limited by its hardware, it's still a very capable machine. With Nestmaker, we're not really constrained by the engine itself. If really, we could just ditch the engine entirely. Literally developing a game in a word processor of our choice. However, as far as hardware is concerned, I enjoy the Game Boy more. I really love the Game Boy's 2-bit aesthetic. I love the Game Boy sound chip. I love how you can do so much with so little. GB Studio is easier to work with. And despite its limitations, I did say I wanted to work within limitations. Not to mention it allows me to focus more on the design of the game rather than spend my time in 
programming hell. This was a really difficult decision for me, but in the end, I've decided to go with both. Yes, both. I'm not even following my script right now. I was originally going to pick Nest Maker, but you know what? I'm just going to do both. Feature creep, overextending myself, mania brought on by ADHD that I'll never be able to follow through on after I inevitably crash. Psh, what's that? But for real, there are legitimate reasons why I'm going to do both. Or at least make an attempt, and I'm actually legit not following a script right now, so prepare for this to be a little bit rambly. One of the key things about designing your own game is not to get too in over your own head. Like, I know, I know, but just hear me out. If you're a first-time developer, you want to start with a simple project. The first game you make is never going to live up to your own expectations, and having something with a ton of feature creep is a good way to get yourself burnt out. You want to start with something simple, something that you know you can finish, something that you can make mistakes with, something that you can learn from, something that allows you to carry your own experiences over to make more ambitious projects. Nintendo themselves didn't just come right out and make Super Mario Bros. 3. They had to learn with a far more simple and scope Super Mario Bros. and learn what bad game design was with the Super Mario Bros. 2. If I start with my dream project on the NES, I know I'm probably just going to falter. But if I start my development journey making something on a simpler engine, focusing more on core gameplay mechanics, making something that's more limited in its scope, and maybe learning more about the development process will allow me to do better with future projects. At the very minimum, it allows us to make sure that something gets made. But the goal is to take this experience we learned from developing for the Game Boy and then apply that to future projects. Who knows, maybe this will allow us to get into discussions of developing our own 16-bit game eventually. Maybe even beyond. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. We have our engine... And by that, we also have our platforms, but there is still more we need to do before we can start designing our game. Working with such withered technology, we're going to require some lateral thinking. So we're going to have to learn more about what we're working with. So join me next time where we're going to party like it's 1989, where we're going to take a closer look at the Game Boy, its hardware, its limitations, and what exactly happens when you develop a game. Thank you for joining me on this journey, and I'm really excited to have you along for the ride. I'll see you next time on Project Boken. This is Soberdorf reminding you that gaining experience builds character. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go shill. So I'm not going to bother scripting this either, and I'm probably not even going to edit it other than to take out the long pauses as I think of my words, because I kind of feel like asking for money during everything that's been going on with everyone. Uh, a little tone deaf, really. Times are incredibly difficult for everybody, and it feels like we're all just passing around the same $50 bill, essentially. I mean, genuinely, I'm not doing this for success or money or anything like that. I mean, also, don't get me wrong, I probably should. I need to eat and pay bills just like everyone else, and focusing more on the channel's success allows me to do more projects like these. The only time I have to work on a game or make these videos is in between editing videos for other channels. Someday I'm gonna have to figure out how to make this channel and these projects more sustainable, but today is not that day. Instead, I'm just gonna give a gentle reminder that I have a Patreon if you want to support the videos there, and if you want to support Project Boken more directly, I've changed my coffee to focus specifically on that project. I might end up dropping a little bit more information on Project Boken on both of them, just minor things that aren't worth making a video about, but I've never paywalled any of my content before, so I don't plan on starting now. I'm a firm believer in information should be free. I mean, honestly, after these games are done, I'll probably end up, you know, uploading it to ROM sites myself, because it's more important to me for other people being able to enjoy it if they want. That being said, if you want to follow the project, you can hit subscribe and click that bell for whatever good that actually does. You can comment on what you had for dinner to boost the algorithm, I guess. Share it with people that you think might be interested. Or sticking around this far to hear my rambling and watch me thank all the wonderful people who've supported the channel thus far. I am definitely bad at marketing the channel, so I'm extremely appreciative of these people who saved me from myself. Like legit, especially in times like these, they're the real MVPs here. 
Also, hopefully within the next month or so, there should be a new Final Fantasy XI guide coming out. 20th anniversary and all that. And that's probably what I'm gonna go do right now. Till next time, this is Soberdorf reminding you that gaining experience builds character.